So, um, hi, I'm Kartek, and I'm here to talk about neural interfaces, which I'll briefly explain as we go on. So, I'd like to start my ta talk with a thought experiment. So, and many of you would have heard about it, it's called the ship of TCS. Let's say there's a ship with multiple components, uh, uh, which makes up the ship. And what I do is, I'm going to remove certain components and replace it. So, I start removing one component. I start removing the next component, and over a period of time, in case if I remove all of these components and replace it with completely new components, the question here is, is it the same old ship or is it a new ship? And I have to replace the ship here itself with Albert Einstein. As you know, Albert Einstein is one of the greatest inventors of all time. He has been a theoretical physicist, worked on black holes and theory of relativity, due to which we have had numerous inventions which has been a major milestone for humankind. And since I've replaced the ship with Albert Einstein, I'm again going to do an experiment with Albert Einstein. I'm, what I'm going to do is, I'm going to first remove his limbs, which is arms and legs. I'm going to replace it with prosthetics, step number one. The question here is, is he Albert Einstein? Probably most of you will agree, yes, it's Albert Einstein. And then step number two, I'm going to replace most of his organs, which can be transplanted. I'm going to take it out and put it in a new 19-year-old boy's organ, organs into him. Is he the same Albert Einstein? Probably yes. And then, we're going to do a cosmetic surgery on him, completely changing his appearances, skin tone, and the way he looks. And so the question here is, is he Albert Einstein? Probably yes, because I, when I go and interact with him, he's going to talk about physics, he's going to talk about something which I cannot even understand, right? So, now, the final step. What I'm going to do is, I'm going to create some changes in his brain, which is due to some brain injury, and I'm going to hit certain parts of his brain, due to which he loses his memory, which is, which is, which most cases happens in patients with Alzheimer's, the last stages of Alzheimer's, where they lose, lose their memory, and they even forget who they are. Along with all these changes, if we also lose his memory and intelligence, the question right now to ask is, is he Albert Einstein? I'm going to leave you there, and we'll get, come to this question at the end of the session. So how does Albert Einstein was able to invent all these things? How was he super intelligent? To really understand that, we need to get back to evolution. So evolution of living organisms has been there for millions of years from prokaryotes to eukaryotes to reptiles and mammals. And finally, we also as a homo species, we evolved. And the last stage of evolution is we sitting here, which are homo sapiens. But what makes us different? And what makes us stay at the top of the evolutionary pyramid? Because as humans, we are able to sit here, discuss, and exchange information. We have built a very efficient civilization, a lot of tools which has never been even thought of uh, in previous species that have lived and walked on this planet. What is so special about us? And if you look at closely, the most distinctive feature that differentiates Homo sapiens with others is human brain. If you look at the image on the left, you can see uh, uh, a graph of the evolutionary period and the brain capacity. And Homo sapiens has the largest brain capacity ever possible in the evolution. Brain capacity, not in terms of size, but in terms of brain volume. And uh, on the image on the right, talks about what makes human beings special structurally. If you see reptiles, they have a basic uh, brain structure which has survival instincts. They just need to survive. And then as evolution went pro progressed, it wanted species which has also the limbic system, which is the emotional brain. They take care of other species. They have basic instincts, which is pleasure, lust, and all the other uh, characteristics, and also bonding and affection, which you've seen in chimpanzees and human monkeys. And the third part, which is very, very distinct for human beings, is something called as the neocortex. Neocortex is the front and the uh, outer surface of the brain, which covers completely. And that's the region of the brain which is important for cognition, important for logical reasoning, and also important for very basic and specific to human nature, which is music and art, uh, which we cannot expect in other species. So, with 
neocortex with the power of neocortex, we have achieved enormous inventions and discoveries as we have come along and we have built civilization as I mentioned. So the next question that humanity was asking after doing all these achievements is how were how are humans able to do all these things? And the only way to know that is to study human brain. And this is the only time in planet Earth where a, hum, a person with a human brain is studying a human brain, which is completely like a paradox. So human brain, as you know, it's, uh, it weighs now like 1.5 kg sitting on the uh, bottom of your skull. And it's, it is known for various things, right, from our emotions, and it's also the seat of consciousness, seat of your thinking, your behavior, your sensory processing, and the whole processing unit, as you know. But what makes human brain so different and what makes humans intelligent and able to build these civilizations? Same question comes to Albert Einstein, uh, Albert Einstein's question, right? So that was one experimentation done after Albert Einstein's death, which is after there's a person called Harvey who took, who stole Albert Einstein's brain and kind of went to his lab and dissected and wanted to understand Albert Einstein's brain. And once he was studying the molecular structures of those, he was able to figure out certain things, which is there was an increased number of glial cells in the cortex, and there was also a lot of cranial foldings which were huge than a comparatively normal person. And then that was the first uh, critical uh, point where we noted that there are some structural changes which contribute to intelligence. So here comes the next point. Since Albert Einstein has been one of the key uh, players in the whole human milestones, can we create more Albert Einstein's? Is it, is it good enough uh, for human civilization? In case if we wanted to do that, there are two important things that we need to think about. One is, what made Albert Einstein Albert Einstein? It is his brain. So we need to understand human brain on the first hand. And second thing is, okay, you understand the human brain, what next? You need to create that on another person. So you need to also alter the brain activity in order to influence the brain activity of a human being so that you can uh, also influence and create more other aspects who knows in the future. And that's where I want to introduce you something called as neural interfaces. Neural interfaces, as the term says, neural and interfaces. It's a bridge between our brain and the external world. So neural means neuron. Neural interfaces are being used for two purposes. A first one is to read the brain, which is to understand your brain activity. And to write, the, write on the brain, which is to influence or stimulate, or whatever you may call it, on brain, or do both, right? So let's talk about understanding. The first step of uh, uh, going deeper into understanding all our human-related uh, behaviors. The three questions that we need to ask, and I'm going to talk about here, is can we read and write on human brain? That's the first question. Number two, why should we read and write on human brain? I mean, people not necessarily need Albert Einstein, so that would not be the whole purpose of humanity as well. And, say, in case we are able to read and write a human brain, what are the consequences? What is the future that holds for humanity? And these are the three points that I'm going to cover majorly in this talk. Reading on the brain, we have used for a long period of time something called as neuro imaging, which are tools that can help you measure and understand your brain activity. The tools kind of evolved, say, from the period of 1895 to even right now, till 2000. So a lot of tools have come up to understand human brain, and that has led to different applications. It starts from x-rays, which is basically trying to understand, uh, look at the structure uh, uh, from the outer surface, and EEGs, or electrocardiography, where you place a set of electrodes on your skull and try to record the electrical activity in, uh, in different parts of your brain, because neurons are basically firing and it's uh, the electrical potential difference that makes it fire and also activate and deactivate. This leads to different behaviors. And you have seen, uh, definitely heard about MRIs, which takes, uh, I mean, looks at the structural images of the brain, of different regions in the brain. And there are also uh, tools like fMRI, which is functional magnetic resonance imaging. But you look at the structure, finally you also look at the function of the brain. Well, you look at blood circulation levels and you look at which part is active, which part is not active at that point of time. And the fourth image is an uh, 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 image from uh, Neuralink, which you know, probably know as Elon Musk's company. What this does is uh, this, brain, this monkey uh, over here basically 
has an implanted brain chip which kind of records the brain activity inside the brain. It's called intracortical recording. So get into the brain, not on the surface of the brain, but put electrodes inside your brain and record it. You have huge bandwidth, you get a lot of accurate data uh, on how your brain is working. And here the monkey is trying to control uh, a computer using your brain, which we'll uh, talk in later phases. And there are a lot of ways uh, which we read the brain. Okay, we've read it. Now how are we going to write it? Uh, there are ways. Now I'm trying to write things on your brain because we all know how it's being written. The sensory stimulus. You hear things, you see things, and all the other senses as well. Every day you get millions of data that's getting into your brain. And that's how your brain is written. And your brain has a phenomenon called neuroplasticity, which is it changes each and every second based on the triggers and based on your learnings and your experiences. And the second part is these are which we experience on a day-to-day -day basis. The second part is something called deep brain stimulation, which are commonly being used in epilepsy patients, where uh, once you have this abnormal filing in certain regions, you get something called as, uh, epilepsy of fits, people call it like that. So in case you wanted to stop it, you implant an electrode at the region of the brain, and then constantly stimulate it so that you can control the neuronal firing in that region. And it's found to be effective, not just for epilepsy, but even for Parkinson's patients to control tremors. The third image is talks about multiple modalities. One thing is called neurofeedback. Neurofeedback is, to give you a very simple analogy of neurofeedback, say you're playing a game, uh, say uh, you're playing uh, any, any kind of game, and right now what, how, how do you play the game? Basically using keyboards or your mobiles or even virtual reality and a lot of interaction that's coming, right? So neurofeedback basically plays the game through your brain activity. So in case, uh, it may be, for, to put it a simple example, it measures my focus levels in case if I'm highly focused, the game acts according to me. In case I'm not focused, the game acts against what I wish to uh, get those rewards or things like that. So based on that, your, your brain can be trained to achieve the state that it can be in. And there are other uh, advanced forms of uh, writing in the brain, which is neurostimulation, which is uh, using electric pulses or magnetic pulses to influence certain regions of the brain. Uh, so that it can change or alter the neuronal plasticity, which you're already doing it with senses, but that does it with precision and with the want of you want to do it. And there's a whole new world of communication that's coming up. So you really you have the capabilities of reading and writing. And there's something that's communication where you communicate. So I stand here, and maybe in the next 50 years, I come again to give a TEDx talk, but I don't need to talk to you. I just need to think, and it gets to your brain. And I'm not talking some sci-fi concepts here. That is a, pro, uh, a scientist at the University of Washington who have done this, where you have a person with a brain uh, imaging setup on one side of the country and a brain stimulator setup on the other side of the country, and they both play games. And say a person A wants to move a game in certain aspects. So what he does is he thinks about it, and the signal goes from that person to this person over the internet, and this person moves the game exactly the way he wanted to move it. And there's not some sci-fi concept that's happening here. And if you see the second, it's, it's an experiment conducted by DAPA where uh, the person sitting is a paralyzed person who cannot move the limbs and is iso uh, she's isolated and she has no help. You, you have seen this even in your uh, people whom you might know. So their life is like really pretty worse. So what this brain computer interface does is you read your brain and she thinks that I want to move that robotic arm and help me feed me. And she thinks the robotic arm comes and feeds her. And this is what is happening in right now technology by understanding and reading the brain. And a lot of examples of it. So majorly, why do we do that? I and mean, that's the question. This is an introduction to the tools. Why do we really need and what is the state of the art right now, right? The major state of the art technologies are being used in neurology specifically because all neurological conditions has most probably the structural change in your human brain. If you're able to diagnose it and you're able to write on it as well, you'll be able to treat a lot of conditions. And mental health, is, neuropsychiatry is a booming phase because right now mental health is mostly very subjective and there are a lot of things which uh, people kind of don't understand it really yet. Why is it happening? So neuroimaging tools can kind of give a light on what is happening in these disorders as well as stimulate because neurostimulation has been used in treating conditions like depression, or schizophrenia and a lot of other conditions as well. So this can be potentially used in these conditions. And Defense, uh, so U.S. defense and Chinese defense, even Indian uh, defense, are looking for technologies which can help improve the cognitive capabilities of the soldiers. 
And U.S. has already launched a project where they wanted their soldiers to communicate using their brain for super fast communication and building a war situation. Where you cannot take a walkie-talkie or talk to your soldier at that point of time. You don't have enough time or else you'll get killed. And gaming is something which is super exciting where I play a game right now. It's very static that I play a game that goes, the avatar goes and takes me something. But I want avatar to be very real. I want avatar to interact with me. It has to be emotional. It has to understand the mind space. It has to be a friend whom I'm working with. And that will happen with the evolution of neuro technologies. And if you're able to understand mental states and emotions. And there is a very critical example of a marketing, which is Coke versus Pepsi paradox. There's an experiment conducted where they placed Coke and Pepsi in front of uh, a person who's blindfolded, right? There was an experiment where he was asked to take Coke and Pepsi and say which one is better. The person took it and said, oh, Pepsi is better, right? So, and then they put it in front of an fMRI machine and took, his, uh, took open, uh, I mean, the, uh, the blindfolding and asked him to uh, see the two cups. There's one is Coke and one is Pepsi. And he drank it and said, Coke is better. So what happened here? The brand, brand image of Coke has really has affected his emotional attention and memory retention of that name, and that kind of influences behavior to say that Coke is better. And that's what is happening. Uh, we get a newer understanding of why we like something. And that is a point where you can even improve the cognitive capabilities of a school children. You can improve its memory, you can improve its attention, and think of what are the possibilities that can come for even learning. Okay, now we've talked about all these things. What is the future? Where are we going to go with these technologies? And that's when uh, uh, I'd like to turn a, a word called continuous closed loop neural interfaces. Now, we have understood how to read, how to write, but can we create Albert Einstein? That's the question. We are in the very, very premature stages of understanding. And in the past 20 years, our understanding has drastically increased because we're able to monitor human brain continuously. While I'm talking to you, while I'm seeing a product, while I'm seeing my mom or my brother, while I'm seeing it, uh, things which I want to see, you, you measure those activity in the brain and see what ha what's happening there. So once you're able to monitor it continuously, a whole window of opportunity is open to understand the brain. And as you go deeper and deeper inside the brain, you'll get new, new information. And that's the same way we are able to create, understand all this like heart and able to transplant it, right? So initially it was something unknown and now it's a machine. The same thing would happen to the human brain as well. And what's closed loop? So you understand it. I don't want just understanding. I don't want data. I'm bored of it. What do you do? The, the algorithm has to help me to get better. I have to get cognitively better. I have to get mentally better. What are you going to do? Okay, understand myself. I understand me better. And help me do, help me give the right stimulus at the right time. You stimulate my brain at certain points. I'll give me a visual stimulus. Whenever I'm, whenever I'm down, I'll go to them, please record and sense that I'm down and show an image of a person whom I love the most. And suddenly I change. And that's where the future is going towards. You have a digital twin which is going to help you understand yourself better. Are we ready for this change? Are we there yet? It's going to take a good amount of time, a good amount of years to even cross there uh, because we are in a very, very basic stages. And we'll be able to com completely understand the brain. We don't have an answer right now. And that's where neuroscientists like us are going towards. But if this happens, it's going to open up a huge window of opportunities for us to understand ourselves, for us to get better, and also to create a lot of conditions in human society. But on the other side, is it safe? If you ask to a common person, oh, it sounds scary. Oh, is it not safe? I'm not sure what if somebody hacks my brain, right? These are the debates that goes on. And this is for every technology. If you see the invention of personal computing, if you see the invention of other technologies, variables as well, this was the initial debate. The thing is, if we are able to have government bodies which can regulate the process of development of these technologies and use it properly, humanity would be at the safe hands and use the technologies to our advantage. And that's where we want to go with your activities. Now, coming back to Einstein again, will we be able to build an Einstein? The question is, is that an Einstein? Is that you or me? What is you or me? We don't have an answer right now, but as we get into understanding the human brain, 
and have the capability to re-engineer ourselves, you can look at two possible futures. Where I say Einstein is angry, Einstein is weird, Einstein is crazy, he is intelligent, or he's less intelligent, and say X amount of features and term that as his character throughout his life. Or I give him a new opportunity where he has the ability to re-engineer himself. He has the ability to change himself according to what he wants, and there's no something called a static. What future are we going towards? Hope we build, we work together to build a great future where humanity is in safe hands. Thank you.